Armando and Nick, thanks for being on Digital Futures. Thanks very much. Thank Great you. To be here. So let's kick this off on a positive note. Paint a picture for an everyday consumer, say, of some examples of where big data is being used in a very clever, unusual and yet valuable way to provide meaningful benefit. Armando. Yeah, uh, sure. I mean, it, I think it's um, uh, the field I've been working recently on the medical data is quite uh, uh, extraordinary because we, now we have the possibility to use all the, your DNA or your data, your, your uh, medical records in order to uh, create uh, very specific target medicines that treat your disease based on your genetics and not only based on your symptom. This will be really uh, revolutionary, really cool, and it will change the way we treat uh, uh, patients. And indeed, major social good there as well. Nick, what about you? I love the idea of big data in, in the medical space, but um, like in a day-to-day -day life, people will be super familiar with uh, music services. And uh, now with people going out doing fitness and running and everything, how music is being triggered by a lifestyle, um, in real time and how friends and networks of people are all communicating to choose music. I think that's a, a real uh, current day use of big data that's, that people are well, loving because it's music. But then both of these examples actually make it very palatable and accessible for people because we're talking about, in this case, a lifestyle area, which is music. And in your case, for example, health. And certainly big data in education and in tackling crises and epidemics by governments is another fantastic area that I tend to read a lot about. Now, this is for both of you. The main concern that I hear from consumers quite frequently tends to be, is my data an asset that could be mined without my losing control of it? Um, what's your take on that? Nick, let's start with you. Well, I think uh, the way that it's referred to is the first thing to think about. So mining is such an industry term. Um, it's like saying to someone, yeah, come into my house, have a look around, have a mine around, have a dig around. It has a slightly ominous sound to it. Actually, exactly, it? exactly. Yeah, it um, but if you put the consumer in control and you start talking about lending someone something, that's where you keep in control. So we have this real uh, philosophy around the difference of selling and licensing. And if you license, you're going to keep control of it. So you can start to realize a value behind it without losing control. And I think terminology and then how that's put into practice is a big part of it. Armando, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, I'm completely aligned with Nick. It's, uh, I think it, uh, it's not clear for users, especially older ones, that uh, what is doing with, uh, being doing uh, with the data. And uh, as a consumer, uh, I mean, I uh, recently knew that uh, my iPhone keeps track of all my positions in the maps. I didn't know that. Nobody uh, explained me. And uh, I think the user should be really in control and companies should really come forward with very transparent and very clear trade-offs between your privacy and what you get uh, uh, like in promotions or whatever, you, doing your, using your data. So I think it's really uh, lots of things to, 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 to work in this uh, respect, to make this process more transparent. Armando, really good food for thought there, so thank yeah. you for that. Now, Nick, moving on to you, as the founder of People.io, and I'm very impressed by what you're doing, by the way, you're also in the thick of things. Now, what specific steps might government, large companies, SMEs and startups take to boost personal data transparency for citizens? Well, I think you have to start by understanding the problem in a bit more detail. Um, and the three areas that we're focusing on are privacy, control and reward. Um, if, you, if you give someone control, um, that helps them understand the impact of the use of their data, which is the first most important part. Uh, once they understand the impact, then you can consider privacy. It's a byproduct of that control. Um, and of course, around all of that, you need to start giving fair value for a person's data. Um, if people are benefiting from your data and your information without you even knowing, that's, a, that's an issue that goes back to the control. So understanding those problems in a bit more detail will then start to build the opportunities where companies, organizations, the government and the consumer can all kind of win. Very eloquently put. What do you think we might expect as some truly compelling applications of big data in action that actually might seem completely unlikely now, but will be a reality or could be a reality? Let me qualify that. Let's say five years from now. Armando. Yeah, good question. It's uh, something I've been actually working on. It's uh, um, a technique called deep learning neural networks, kind of a buzzword at the moment. But uh, what people don't know is that really the, the uh, the evolution that uh, has been possible in these recent years in terms of uh, not only image recognition, but in this case, natural language processing. So we are uh, coming to a stage where you can put an answer to a, a machine 
uh, concerning a limited set of knowledge and uh, the machine can come out with, uh, with an answer for that question. And uh, I can see that uh, having a huge impact like in call centers or in every organization that leads a lot with, uh, with uh, answering uh, uh, questions. Some companies are really profiting from that and coming forward with uh, approach that I think is really uh, um, revolutionary and, uh, and uh, we'll see completely uh, 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 new work coming from this, uh, this, uh, this topic of uh, natural language processing. Interesting, Nick. I think there's a really interesting area around the data economy. So if you start to look at things like Airbnb and Uber, um, they're companies that enable people to realize a value from an asset they already have. So Airbnb is an asset of housing, Uber is an asset of a car. Um, I really see an opportunity where people can leverage the value of their data um, and keep control of it. And so that's the area we're exploring and really excited by. Right. So a lot of food for thought there, guys. Thank you so much for a very, very snappy, fast-paced <laughs> discussion. We've managed to cover quite a lot instead yeah. of six questions. That's exactly what we love to do on Digital Futures. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. It may very well be that there's some misalignment between our perception of how collection of data is making us too identifiable and the reality where not all cases of big data use are intrusive and indeed many are anonymized and aggregated with a lot of meaningful benefit for wider society. Worth giving some thought to. This has been Digital Futures. Thank you for watching.